<laughs> as we have in life every single action that you do can become virtuous including attending this online Buddhism session but never forget please and we are encouraging ourselves to do this more and more please remember everything you do literally from tying your shoe to brushing your teeth to teaching a class can and I'm helping a client sort out their finances, providing gas and essential necessities to people in their everyday life. Whatever it is we're doing, at least in the morning, we can remind ourselves that there's always a way to look at all of our most mundane activities as benefiting others. And um, so in this Mahayana tradition that we, that Christopher and I and all y'all by extension and whatever level of motivation you have, to always keep that in mind in your everyday activities with all of your actions of body, speech, and mind. And as you as we get in the habit of doing that more and more, the um, the realm that we all dream of, the purified, non-harming, peaceful, beautiful realm we dream of, that's how it comes into existence in the long run. So when we take refuge, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, what we're taking refuge in is this commitment to participate in the creation through these tools, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Those are sort of the, the tools at our disposal in a general sense to create this purified realm. So with that in mind, we'll say it in English and then chant it in Tibetan. I take refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, to the positive potential I create by listening to teachings and the other paramitas. May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye chodran sokki chopnam la, chamchu pardu dakni kyapsu chi, Daki chinyan gi pe sonam ki, Frola penshir sangye druparisho, Sangye chodan soki chopnam la, Chong chu padu dakni kyapsu chi, Daki chin soki pe sonam ki, Drola Penshu Sangye Drupare Show. Now, the four immeasurable thoughts in light of this lineage and this aspiration to be a, to help co create um, a non harming, beautiful, purified realm, universe, existence, these four immeasurables are are not just something that we say to generate a nice feeling. They're actually, in some ways you could think of them, and I do, uh, as this is the reality that I have come here into this practice to be part of generating this reality for sentient beings. This is why I practice Buddhism. This isn't just a nice thought that we pass through on our opening prayers. This is a restatement every time we say these, this is a restatement of our, our wish and our commitment and our intention to participate in this. So when we say that, it when we say this, we say it from a point of view of a person committed to participate in this happening and through our reliance on what we're studying and trying to understand, we become more effective at creating these four immeasurable states of existence. So here we go. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering and may all sentient beings abide in equanimity 
free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. I mentioned this a few weeks ago and I'll sit, remind us all again, there's a version of this for measurables that starts with having acquired equanimity of that is free from attachment to friends and hatred for enemies. So it's the prerequisite in this other Tantra version of these four measurables. The prerequisite is equanimity. And what does that mean? What does that really mean to us as uh, practitioners as we become more and more committed to this path? It means, and this is very hard to do in our world especially, dropping our biases and always arguing with ourselves about our biases. You'll see it creep in in the funniest ways where you assume certain things are just a given. Well, of course, everybody knows that so-and-so is an idiot or everybody knows that, you know, wheatgrass juice is the best thing for you. Or, you know, I mean, you could go in the range. So as a practitioner, we should constantly be challenging our, our biases and our, quote, givens, what we believe is a, quote, given. Because as... Uh, Claudia pointed out several sessions ago in her exploration of how different kinds of critters experience their existence. Even every single human being on this planet comes to their understanding of how things exist through countless causes and conditions. And the only appropriate response we as practitioners are meant to have in response to the behavior of others is love and compassion, seeking to understand and where possible, providing love and assistance. All right. I, you know, every time I do this, this is just the things that come up with for me doing these on a daily basis. So, um, so at this point, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but it's good now to invoke the idea that, um, in this universe where all sentient beings have a diversity of perceptual abilities and, and sight abilities of sight and sound and so forth, that although we can't see them with our current uh, gear, sensory gear, we are surrounded by enlightened beings, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and they are, they are surrounding us all the time. And the more we upgrade our intention, the more surrounded, you know, like, energy attracts is, is what is said. So envisioning that um, part of this movement towards enlightenment, uh, we're out of appreciation for the assistance that we give, get from the teachers. We visualize the teachers that we know and the teachers that are out there that we don't know that have contributed to the understanding that we're developing. And so we say the seven limb prayer as a way of expressing our gratitude and devotion towards the teachers and the examples that have come forward and are not hiding uh, their assistance and guidance to us. So we're, yeah, gratitude and appreciation for those guides. And so we say the seven limb prayer with that in mind. Uh, reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind and present clouds of every type of offering, actual and mentally transformed. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. And I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. So that's our way of saying to the enlightened beings, where I'm on your team, we're in this together. Yeah, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> and then last but not least for the preliminary prayers, 
uh, kind of a further demonstration of our commitment to co-creating a purified realm with only happy beings, we envision it. As we know, neuro, even neuroscience talks about the power of visualization, but we've known this in our world for a long time that um, especially sports and job interviews and things that are very mundane, if we visualize ourselves performing beautifully and excelling in whatever action we're about to take, if we envision it first, we are able to then behave into that visualization. So this mandala offering is like that. Our big gift to this uh, assembled merit field of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, our gift is that we're joining them in the visualization and therefore the, the manifestation over time, over however long it takes uh, of this purified realm. And we'll use the formula that doesn't necessarily, isn't, the words maybe don't correspond to things we understand or even care about, but the main bottom line is just imagine that you're uh, visualizing or just visualize the most wonderful realm existence and uh, experience for all sentient beings that you're participating in that and that's what you're visualizing. And so when we say this mandala offer, um, it's with that in mind. And again, we'll say it in English so that we can uh, connect with meaning. This ground that I visualize, anointed by perfume and strewn with flowers, adorned by Mount Maru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine it as a Buddha field and offer it. May all beings enjoy this pure land. And picture all sentient beings enjoying that and that you help bring it about. And then we offer it in Sanskrit with the line, Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Nirya Tayami. <laughs> I like that, Nirya Tayami. <laughs> um, I do want to add How I love you, how I love you. <laughs> I do want to add one uh, one prayer. I'm not going to explain it because I've explained it a lot. It's the it's the Manjushri uh, mantra. Om Arapatsana D. We'll do uh, this is to because the the topic that we are um, uh, getting into today is definitely a wisdom topic. So um, we're calling on. Used to always have us do this. Yeah. So we'll we'll, we'll we just do you know half a mile philosophy. of this. So remember at the end. You know, we repeat the final syllable, d -d 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 -d, and feel as if we are awakening our um, our Buddha nature, and particularly the wisdom aspect of that. Okay. <laughs> Omar Abatana, the 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 all right um so as i was saying uh before we started recording this uh topic the two truths is is a huge is a huge topic it's one of the most important topics in buddhism and in mahayana buddhism particularly to understand um the nature of reality 
So we're going to take as many sessions as we need to until we all feel somewhat comfortable that we have a kind of a working conceptual understanding of, of the two truths, because it's, um, it's, it's, quite, it's very, very profound, really. So uh, we'll open, we'll open each of these practices, each of these sessions with a, a meditation practice. And it's the meditation practice that we, we did last week, shamatha. <clears throat> so shamatha is calm abiding in single pointed concentration. And the very first step in meditation is to train the mind to concentrate on one point one object for a definite period of time. In this way, what we do is we, we develop a laser-like consciousness that can be used to make extremely precise observations about the mind itself. We begin by adopting the seven-point uh, posture of Varochana Buddha. So the first is to sit in a comfortable cross-legged position on a straight-backed padded chair or a meditation cushion, whichever works best for you. If sitting cross-legged is uncomfortable, sit on a comfortable padded chair uh, with the legs relaxed, the knees uh, at uh, right angles and the feet uh, flat on the floor. Hand, the hands should rest gently in the lap uh, with the right hand placed on top of the left hand. Both palms facing up. Can you see this? Yeah, both palms facing up, and the tips of the thumbs should touch slightly and be held, and this should all be held a little below the navel. Uh, during one during the meditation practice itself, this position of the hands is an expression of the unification of method, the, the compassion of actions that we take for the benefit of all sentient beings, and wisdom. Wisdom, the wisdom that understands the nature of reality. So, so this the method, the compassion, as its foundation is wisdom. So it's sitting in the palm of the wisdom with the with the uh, the two thumbs touching. So that it represents the unification of these two. You're gonna run out of time. I took too much time. Yeah, we won't. We won't run out of time. We'll take okay. as much time as we need. Um, the body should be held upright like an arrow or like a pile of golden coins stacked one on top of the other. A straight back helps the mind stay alert and facilitates the flow of the inner winds or prana, which are the subtle movements of energy that circulate within the body and the consciousness. The shoulders and arms should be drawn back a little and slightly curved so that they are evenly placed on either side of the body. The elbows should remain a little away from the body. The head should be straight and centered, not too high or bent down too low. Keep the chin slightly tucked in and the nose held in line with the navel and the two thumbs. Try not to bend the neck sideways or backwards. The teeth and the lips should be held in a natural position with the teeth barely touching. Keep the face, jaw, and the lips soft and relaxed. Let the tongue rest gently against the upper palate behind the upper teeth. The eyes should be slightly open, gazing past the tip of the nose. If the position of the head is correct, the eyes will then focus gently and unforced on the floor about three feet in front of you. Uh, and in general, don't let your posture be too tight. Let, it, let the body be very relaxed, very natural. If you get tight in certain areas, uh, take a deep breath and then exhale the tension with the next out breath. So for the purposes of this group meditation, we're gonna have a shortened introductory breathing practice to quiet the conceptual mind. So we'll do 11 breaths rather than 21. So with each full in and out breath, counting as one breath, uh, mentally count five breaths forward from one to five. After the fifth breath, mentally count five backwards, five, four, three, two, one, to one, and then the final breath, um, think that it's, you've arrived at zero, okay? So this makes a total of 11 breaths. So let's just, let's do that. Five breaths in, five breaths out, and then the one zero breath.
So the purpose of this introductory breathing is to calm the conceptual mind. The next thing we do then is to set the motivation for the meditation we're doing. And so what we need to do is cultivate the altruistic intention of bodhicitta, the awakened heart and mind of compassion and wisdom as the basis of motivation for the practice of shamatha. As you maintain the awareness of the flow of your breath, think to yourself along these lines. With this practice of shamatha, may the unlimited positive potential of my compassion and wisdom be awakened for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings have happiness and its causes May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. And may they abide in equanimity, free from attachment for some and hatred for others. May I be blessed by all the Buddhas, Dharma and Sangha with the means to accomplish this. Merge this motivation with the in and out flow of your breath. Okay, so now we will actually begin. And I'm going to. Um, I wanted to. Oh dear. Mention something. This is out of. Uh, a book that Geshe Nima gave us, but when they talking about the breath, he mentioned specifically if you're having uh, issues with a very busy mind, when you do that breathing, that it's helpful to imagine breathing in through your left nostril and out through your right nostril. And he said you can try that 21 times if you find that your mind is still very jumpy. The way he puts it is... Um, If your mind is preoccupied with worldly ideas such as tomorrow I shall do this or that, uh, tomorrow I shall tell this person this and such, and he said these thoughts um, that, uh, exhale through the right nostril and imagine that, so when you're doing the 20 breaths, if you find your mind is very jumpy, you can do that. In through your left nostril, out through your right, can help. Okay, we're going to do this for six minutes, um, starting now. Place your awareness at the exact point where the breath enters and exits the nostrils and continuously maintain single-pointed concentration there. When you notice any external or internal distractions arising, make those distractions part of your practice by using them as helpful triggers to remind you of your motivation and again merge the altruistic intention of bodhicitta with the in and out flow of the breath.
it is helpful to do this uh, right upon awakening in the morning. The earlier, the better, actually. Geshe Nima says that our mind is at its most subtle at that time. And um, it's easier to go for a longer period with this. And it's also helpful if you um, time it. You know, you can time it on your on your phone. And then you then you don't have to worry, is, is the time over? Is the time over? How long am I doing this? You just go for a particular set period of time. And um, use that um, motivation of bodhicitta to always bring you back. Any distraction that you have, bring it back. What I often do is I'll just... After I've at the beginning sort of fleshed out what this, you know, motivation is using the four immeasurables and wanting to attain enlightenment for their benefit, then I just internally say to myself, bodhicitta in, bodhicitta out, bodhicitta in, bodhicitta out, and then just focus that motivation on the breath. Um, um, there was a question about the visual component and... Um, the instruction, you know, is to have the eyes half open. Uh, if you read into the material that we, you know, Christopher is referencing, they're 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 always talking about the benefit of keeping the eyes half open because um, it, for a variety of reasons, helps over with time maintaining alertness. Really, um, if. Uh, so the question is, should one, what should one see, quote unquote, as one is, let's say your focus is on um, the breath. And so you've got these, this eye sense power that wants to do something. I have this issue. And so what I do, just to share, and I, so you're not, one is not choosing a visual, ob in this case, one is not choosing a visual object to meditate on. So what I the way I would phrase it is I uh, keep my eyes half open. I kind of as I'm beginning, I just sort of make a mental note of the uh, shapes and forms that are appearing in my half open eyes. You know, so I unfocus them, but I have this thought because this helps me just leave it, which is the thought is you know this these shapes and colors, the light and dark that I'm that's in my visual field. Um, are part of the tapestry of existence and sort of like that, sort of like this is just all part of the tapestry of existence. I don't need to make it into anything. I don't need to block it out. I don't need to do anything, but just let it be what it is. Um, and then my attention goes to uh, whatever the object, the object is. In this case, the breath. breath. Yeah. If you have chosen a visual object um, and there's a wide range. I, I have found that there is, in the 20 or so years I've been attempting this, there's a wide range of people's propensity towards seeing visual images. Some people see, can see like highly detailed paintings in their mind's eye with their half open eyes. They have that type of imagination and some people this this is my category <laughs> don't see diddly squat you know so in my case i've chosen a visual object as my object of meditation and i've read quite a bit about this and the advice is it's sort of like you're trying to recall what your mother looked like you know you you stuck in in this case you study the image and you try to get familiar with it but just like and they're like these brief flashes of kind of like a visual like recollection. Or uh, the other advice is Alexander Berzin has advice that it's like you're waiting in the doctor's office. You're sitting there, your eyes are half open. You know the doctor's going to come in at some point and you know what the doctor looks like. And it's just sort of like this um, open expectation. But in all cases, there's you know, we're meant to keep our, our mind relaxed. I sort of pretend that I'm seeing my visual, my image, if that makes any sense. It's, uh, and my understanding is, because of the nature of reality, um, and the nature of how the mind is so malleable, that over time, somehow this image 
that we become more and more, it feels more and more, for lack of a better word, real. We're familiarized. But in any case, if you're if you're if you're just uh, if you've chosen the breath as your object and you are having questions or issues about what's what do I do with my visual sense power that's distracted by the stuff, my advice and my experience is that it's I've been successful to just go. This is part of the field of existing reality. It's part of the tapestry of it. I don't need to analyze it. There it is. Take it in. Let it be what it is. I just keep my eyes barely open. Yeah, but you're gonna yeah. quote see something. Yeah, and I, I just so I let I just basically let go of it and focus yeah, focus on the breath. Uh, I want to talk about purpose of meditation. I, just, I, I have a question still okay. so that came up. So Brian and I talked about this last week, whether the purpose of this is to think about something without getting distracted, or whether to learn to think about nothing. No, I'm going to tell you what the purpose is right now. This is the next. Thing I've got on the on the list, <laughs> the purpose of meditation. <laughs> um, so, what shamatha meditation does is it trains the mind, our mind, to focus its awareness very precisely on a single object and calmly abide in that awareness. Shamatha, which means calm abiding, and vipassana, which means special insight, are mentioned by the Buddha as two mental qualities that are to be developed in conjunction with each other. In one of the sutras, the Kinsuka Tree Sutra, the Buddha tells us that when the mind is thoroughly developed through shamatha, or calm abiding in single-pointed concentration, afflictive emotions are abandoned. When the quality of vipassana or special insight is thoroughly developed in union with shamatha, our discernment is developed and ignorance is abandoned. The Buddha explains that the mind's ability to maintain very clear awareness is held captive by afflictive states of mind. And the mind's ability to be to very clearly discern something is held captive by ignorance. So with the fading of difficult emotions, afflictive emotions and ignorance through the combined practices of shamatha and vipassana, vipassana the mind's abilities to maintain clear awareness and to clearly discern are released from their captivity of afflictive emotions and ignorance. And this enables us to make great progress on the Bodhisattva path. So that's what the purpose of this is, according to the Buddha. Um, so the quick answer to Claudia's question is that it's to sharpen the ability. To it sharpens our ability to discern, and it gives a, um, a very clear awareness in which to, to have that discernment. Um, I, you know, there's... where is this not distracted by, you know, uh, things that are bothering us or upsetting us? Uh, just as a quick contextual thing for us in our society, and we all know this, but I just want to say it. there are traditions of Buddhist meditation from the Theravada tradition, which the Theravadins are the ones that believe at the end of your path to enlightenment, it slices out and you cease to exist. That's not our tradition. There, there is a tradition in that lineage of uh, meditation is to not think, is to blank your mind. So you will hear out there, you know, that the goal of meditation is to stop all thought. That is our teachers time and time again, including when Geshe Nima was here most recently and, and gave a meditation teaching. But all of our meditate, all of our teachers, all of them address this that there is no point in our tradition to blanking your mind. What because your goal is to become enlightened and you need a really sharp, capable mind. And so the goal is completely different. You're not after lights out, you're after being the most dynamic, aware, whatever. What we're doing with sh shamatha and vipassana is sharpening the tools of our mind. So in our, we are like little isolated 
single person Buddhist centers in a way in our, especially in San Antonio and the way we are in Houston. Um, so we are not surrounded by a lineage where everybody understands what we're talking about when we say meditation. So we, we have an extra burden to be aware of the terminology floating around in the different uh no matter where one is there we need to do well, i'm just saying yeah. if you were at draco mostly monastery with ten thousand monks at least there'd be some verbal no oh, there'd be somebody you could go to yeah anyway all right so um we're going to talk about now there are uh three steps that we take now to understand something and listening is the first step to understanding it's very important to read, to listen, to discuss the various topics that are being raised in Nagarjuna's text. If we don't have enough information, there'll be nothing to contemplate. And if there's nothing to contemplate, there won't be anything to meditate on using the tools of shamatha and vipassana. We'll have nothing to hold in our very clear awareness in terms of information and no means of calmly holding that awareness without becoming distracted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's like showing up with a violin and no music to play. Right. So the, the, the Vipassana is training us to have something to hold within this awareness. And the shamatha is training us to have a very clear awareness within which to hold that. All right. So there's a, there's a very important purpose to it. Um, so the first of the three steps is to understanding is listening, no matter what form it takes. Listening can be reading, discussing, or, or um, watching authentic Buddhist teachings on the internet by qualified um qualified lineage teachers. We, however, we need to be uh, very selective and discriminating uh, in our reading and listening to make sure that the texts and the teachers are authentic and won't lead us astray. Uh, I, Geshe Draco was very clear about this. Geshe Tashi Tsering is very, very clear about this in his writings. So there are, and I am aware of them, there are Dharma teachers out there with brilliant intellects and insights. I mean, they blow your mind away with what they know, but they still hold biased views that do not align with the Buddha's teachings of Dharma. So this can cause some listeners to think that the Buddha's teachings agree with those biased views, which isn't helpful. So this is why it's extremely important to be very discerning, to understand what uh, uh, the authentic lineage is and to not stray from that. Even though a particular teacher may seem very appealing, very intellectual, and um, and yes, they can be telling you things that are, that are helpful, but they, they're the mo sometimes the motivation is a little uh, astray because of their biases. So just to be aware of that. Uh, authentic teachings and texts, such as Nargajuna's Precious Garland, as we know, are often very dense and they use unfamiliar terms. So we need a lot of intelligence and we need patient perseverance just to get at their actual meaning. We may need to repeatedly study them and refer to teachings on them from qualified masters again and again before we're able to conceptually grasp the meaning of what's being said. Geshe Tashi Tsering says that if we steadfastly persist in our practice, though, understanding will come. And I think what both Kavita and I can say after over 19 years or so, it's getting clearer. <laughs> um, real quick on this lineage thing, it's not like uh, this is the only valid lineage either. Just keep that. We are committed to this particular teaching, but as I've said before in the past, think of it like you've shopped. I'm just going to put this in hypothetical terms. You've shopped around. You stumbled upon this particular uh, form of conveying ideas. So this lineage kind of sounds good to you. You like it. It's It's like you found 
a liter uh, uh, let's say you're an author you found a writing coach who whose work you really want to emulate it would be confusing to you to suddenly change to um a different coach like, what's the hell's the name of the author he used to write in cryptic little nonsense sentences you're you if you change styles it can become confusing because um they have you know if i tell you how to get from here to houston and i don't like driving on an uh, ih10 i'm going to tell you a completely different route to get to houston um than somebody who is fine with ih10 and you don't know the difference and you become confused you're given instructions how to get to houston by one person and then you go to a class and hear how to get to houston by a, someone else and it's completely different you know they're both promising you'll get to houston but you as a practitioner can become confused so that's the benefit of uh, and i will just add this one thing what i've noticed myself is once you get to a certain level of understanding as you go along it is more interesting and helpful to hear other points of view because you have a solid fact it's sort of like once you really understand basic chemistry then you can look into um, some more experimental ideas in the chemistry field that, you know, kind of expand, in some ways, your understanding of the fundamentals. Um, so that listening was the first step to understanding. There are two more. Contemplating and meditating. So if we listen without thoroughly understanding what we're listening to, it's pretty useless. So the second step is to contemplate what we have listened to or contemplate what we have read or contemplate what we are studying. So um, this means absorbing uh, our mind deeply into, um, into that subject and whatever we've heard. Contemplation means to investigate what we've heard, know as much as we can about it and to understand it as deeply as we can. Only then are we ready to start meditating, which is the third of the three steps to understanding. Geshe Tsar, uh, uh, Tashi Tsering says that meditation actually comes quite late in the process, not that we shouldn't be uh, practicing the fundamentals of meditation now, which is what we're doing with shamatha right now. But without a fairly deep understanding of the object of our meditation, there's not much to meditate on besides closing your eyes, trying to keep still and, you know, be peaceful. Um, so it's, it's, he says it's hard to get to the level of understanding where meditating on a topic is really useful. We need to have, we need to have already contemplated the, the meditation topic a lot. And effective contemplation requires previously listening or reading, discussing, and studying. And he says there's no way to skip that step. No way to skip it. Now we're going to get into uh, the two truths. You know, understanding that we need to be listening, then contemplating, and then finally, when we have a we have a, a working understanding, then to apply that to meditation. So right now with shamatha, what we're doing is just we're trying to make our awareness a a very clear vehicle with which to then um, focus on what the object of meditation right now is. And right now, it's we're just using the breath. Uh, so now we're talking about the evolution of these two truths. According to all of our teachers, all of them, Geshe Drapa, Geshe Nima, Geshe Sopa, Hazoyans, the Dalai Lama, Venerable Rabina, all of them, they say that a clear understanding of the philosophical systems in Buddhism allows us to appreciate the evolving subtlety of the Buddhist view. It's difficult to fully understand the final view the prasangika view, without a grounding in the less subtle system, similar to how uh, we shouldn't attempt a PhD before getting our, our bachelor's and master's. To jump right to the PhD, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't get the full benefit. Uh, so historically, the Buddha did not systematically teach philosophy. What he did instead is he explained different aspects of philosophy he knew would bring benefit to the particular audience that was listening to him. Um, many years later, many years later, uh, after the Buddha had 
uh, passed away. A more systematic approach was created when several philosophical schools of thought arose out of the rigorous debate between different Buddhist practitioners. So out of that rose what are called the four schools of philosophic tenets. The Tibetan tradition defines four main schools of philosophy that evolved from the Buddha's teachings. These are, we've heard the names of four, Vibhashaka, Sauchantika, Chittamatra, and Madhyamaka. Kentral Rinpoche says that these four schools grew out of the Buddha's teachings on the two truths. So it's important to understand these schools in order to understand the two truths. The Buddha stated that there are two levels in which reality can be experienced, the relative or conventional level and the ultimate level. What can be considered true depends on the level in which you are operating. The first two schools, called Vaibhashika and Sautrantika, Vaibhashika means great exposition school, Sautrantika means sutra school, based on the sutras of the Buddha. So these two schools, Vaibhashika and Sautrantika, searched for the basic building blocks of the universe. And what they came up with was what they called partless particles, something akin to what we would call today subatomic particles. So even back then, they were, I mean, this is, this is a very high level for, you know, um, <laughs> this is a very high level for that time of, of thinking. So they, they, said, they said that this was, these were the building blocks of everything, of the universe, these partless particles. So because of that, they said that these partless particles truly, really exist. They're not just some fabrication, they really exist. So they, those schools became known as realist schools because of this. Both of these schools, both of them assert that, that there's a selflessness of persons. And if you remember what that is, it's the lack or the utter emptiness, you could say, of a substantially existing, self-sufficient mental construct of I, or me. In other words, it is a mental construct. It, there is no uh, actual, inherently, substantially existent I or me. It's a mental construct. And both of these schools will assert that. They will say, yes, there is no self-sufficient, substantially existent I. But both of these schools, what they don't assert is the selflessness of phenomena. Remember, they're saying that these particles these little tiny partless particles of matter, or you might even say light energy, are the building blocks of the universe, and they truly, really exist. So these two schools, however, they differ in the way they understand and interpret that, how those exist. So there is slight differences, we're not going to get into them. This is the extremely abbreviated version, a general, a big general overview of these schools. So now we're going to go to the Arnie school. Any questions about these, these realist schools, the Sautrantika and the Vaibhashika? Any discussion on it? Yeah, I mean, it's just very, very basic information there. So there's not, <laughs> we won't go into much delving. We'll go more later in other, other sessions. Um, the third school, and you may be familiar with this a little bit because of uh, Sh Shantideva, the Shantideva studies, this is called the Chitta Matra. And like Chitta, like Bodhicitta, Chitta means mind. One of the, it can mean mind, it can also mean heart. In this case, it means mind. Chitta Matra, which means the mind-only school of philosophy. And this school questions the intrinsic or inherent reality of external objects. This school argues that although the mind is real, the mind is an inherently real thing according to this school, the objects perceived by the mind cannot have an independent existence because of that very reliance on the mind to be able to ascertain them. So that's just a very, very basic 
I mean, the Chittimatra school is, is uh, also quite profound, but that's the basic view is that because the mind is the thing that's ascertaining and deciding what these objects are, these objects are, are, don't actually truly exist the way they appear at all. They are dependent on the mind. And therefore the mind is the only thing that really truly exists. Is that clear? And these are, these are levels, they're working up. None, none of these, all of these are important. They're important to understand and to contemplate. Actually, and you know, many of their uh, many of their views are correct. Yeah, many of their views are uh, adopted and mm -hmm. included as you progress. It's yeah. sort of like you know, we breathe there, but you know, yeah, um, yeah, they don't. Finally, there's the um, Madhyamaka or the middle way. That means middle way Madhyamaka. That's the Madhyamaka school. That is the fourth, and it's considered to be the most subtle of all of the schools. The Madhyamaka view is the middle way because, because its position uh, lies between what it sees as absolutism, the absolutism of the first schools, that thing, the first two schools, that things do exist the way they appear. That's the absolutist view. Okay, that's you know what what we're, what we're calling absolutism in, in Buddhism here. And they, they um, though that absolute and, uh, absolutism asserts that things exist from their own side, the way they appear. And so Madhyamaka is in the middle of that and the Chittamatra view that asserts, uh, that asserts things and events have no reality at all. And that is a nihilistic view according to the Madhyamaka. It's nihilistic to say nothing out there exists because it only exists in the mind. That's, that's uh, going too far is what Madhyamaka is saying. So it's, it's balancing between absolutism and nihilism. And it's not that the Chitta Mantra is completely nihilistic and that the uh, earlier schools are completely absolutistic, but they have elements of that. And the Madhyamaka is saying, no, they're, they're, we need to find a very a way to balance between these two. So that's basically the over, very, very quick overview of what these four schools are. Any questions there or discussions or confusion? Um, just as a point of interest, should one decide to read up on these four schools? They have a, there's an interesting system they use for you to examine the difference between the four schools. For example, it'll go through like, how do they view objects? And so each school has a way of defining what they mean by objects. How do they view uh, the two truths? So each school will have its own particular way of defining what the two truths are, or even what is enlightenment. And they all have their, the thing that's, a little confusing if you get into it. A little. They can and do use the same terminology, the same words to mean completely different things. And so that becomes somewhat confusing. You just have to know that going in. It's sort of like, um, I don't know, we, we all are familiar with our lives that sometimes yeah. the same words such as, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick a word. This I, is why we're not doing that right now. Just so we're not know, going into that. If you decide to delve into that, um, that'll be something you experience. But it's clarifying because they do say, okay, this is how we view objects, and this is how we view subjects, and each of them has a very different view on what that means. I would never suggest diving into that without a qualified teacher who understands exactly what they're talking about. Well, that's true. I would never suggest it because it's over the top. All right, so we're going on. But it's going on. We just keep it there. We we'll keep it at the simple view of the four schools, the basic thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to go to relative or conventional truth. According to Ken Chul Rinpoche, everything that makes up the world we currently experience. All the various phenomena we encounter, the people, the places, our bodies and minds, they are all examples of relative or conventional truths. 
It is a world that's filled with subjects and objects. There are hosts of different kinds of people, animals, and other sentient beings, all with different levels of sense perception and different perspectives, each interacting with all kinds of things that appear in different ways to each of them. And we've previously discussed this. It's quite clear <laughs> in reality, in this reality, this relative truth reality, no two people, no two animals, no two sentient beings experience exactly the same things. But instead, each of them is the center of their own universe, experiencing their world from a uniquely individual vantage point. I think that's clear to us. I mean, given all the discussions we've had. So when we observe and compare all of these experiences, however, we can see that there are similarities. On the basis of these similarities, we can agree on certain conventions that we can trust. And on the basis of those trustworthy conventions, each being can function and communicate with other beings in order to establish what is true for them from their perspective. Does that make sense? Crickets. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just not to be understated because... All right. um, it makes sense the way you state it. Um, but the to me is always the bigger question has always been then whose perception is correct whose uh, uh, is oh correct? great question brian man you are like on it you were totally on it <laughs> you're totally point. on it that is such a good question all right we, this question will be answered okay while a relative truth may be true for one person being or group of beings it may not necessarily hold true for another. As a very, very simple example, consider the differences in our tastes for food. One being may experience a particular object, say a lump of fresh cow dung, as being delicious food, while another may find it completely revolting and wouldn't even dare let it touch their lips. And we know this. We know you, we humans would not, the majority of us would not even go near fresh dung, cow dung on a field. However, there are flies all over it. It's like the most wonderful, you know, uh, buffet ever, you know? So we know that it's not the same experience, right? If we think then about the ways in which different beings experience what we call the objective world, for instance, the way, uh, another example, the way a tiny insect experiences a puddle of water in their path and the way a human being experiences that. We can begin to understand that different sentient beings have different experiences based on the way the world appears to them. And so it is impossible, impossible, to determine that one is right and the other is wrong. Does that make sense, Brian? Again, the way you say it makes sense. The, the question is where you're going with this because in my mind, I go to the place where, well, if everybody has their own reality and their own sets of facts and their own truths, how do we actually exist in a community uh, where there has to be certain shared acceptance of structure and ethical and moral boundaries in order to have us kind of continue to uh, exist in some way. And, you know, and that's the role of conventions. Right. That that's is the, what conventions are for, exactly that. I think where we get off is that we believe some conventions are correct and others must be wrong. But on our planet, for example, if you lived in the Amazon uh, uh, jungle and, um, you know, certain conventions that are completely right and appropriate for them 
Are you talking about humans? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm just talking within humans. Um, that so. This is the role of conventions, like-minded beings are attracted to each other and form and abide by the convention that's comfortable for them where they are in their evolution. And, uh, you know, I think one of the issues perhaps that's going on in our world now is that we are seeing before our eyes through the media uh, all the ways in which conventional reality of group A does not match conventional right. reality of group B. And sometimes, you know, what's happening right now, say on the political realm, is 95% of the conventional agreements of, say, two opposing groups, 95 of their agreed upon conventions actually overlap. If you, you know, if you were going to take I won't go. So, yeah, it's, yeah, but it's let's just say, take the politics. Whether you like to face it or not, and each of us has our own bias in this way, um, the group that we are not part of, say on a political field, they share 90, 90 to 95 percent of our uh, aspirations. We want a clean environment, future for our kids, no war, people being treated ethically, so on and so forth. We have very different ways of getting there. So this little percentage, but can, so you cannot, you absolutely cannot, as a Buddhist practitioner, say that the group you're not part of is wrong. Right. Because the, each, each group of conventional adherents comes upon their conventional agreement through literally countless lifetimes of experience and conditioning. So you can understand just very briefly, someone who's born in Indiana and raised in multi-generation of farmers with the particular needs and hopes and aspirations and requirements of farmers have a very, very different set of conventions uh, to sustain that uh, in a healthy, uh, reliable way. Their needs and their conventions and what is correct for them is not the same as say, uh, someone uh, multi-generation tech workers coming out of the Silicon Valley with a very different set of needs and conventions. And so their worldview and their worldview um, are completely different and they are both absolutely correct from the point of view and there is no right answer. So this is the dilemma that our, and because our world is now, the borders are erased in some ways, Used to be birds of a feather could flock together and not get in each other's way. So and that's just talking about humans. Yeah, and I, I mean, mean there, are, right. there, there well, is. Well, for us as humans, that's, it, it's that's a multitude where the contention lies. Right. But anyway, right. I can see that with worldviews, that there is not like there's no absolute truth. I mean, I was thinking yesterday about an example where it's not that obvious that there are like multiple ways of looking at it. And, and one is like space and time are two things where we thought that was sort of an objective reality. And now we know. That's not the case, but I think for our minds to accept that, we're not even close to that. Right, right. For our minds to accept that, we need to expand them. <laughs> we need to expand our, our, our awareness. You and, know, and that's that's a, a lot of what Buddhism is about. This particular path is expanding our awareness to take in more. Um, and getting back to this issue of bias, we also need to remember we don't, no matter what looks like the objective appearing action another entity is playing, taking. They're throwing a bomb, a grenade, raising a flag, taking down a flag, burning a flag, you know, whatever. We don't know their motivation. And remember, their motivation is the momentary outpouring of countless lives of conditioned, correct conditioned experience. Granted, I mean, so objectively speaking, so just like in the life of the Buddha, when the Buddha killed the guy that was going to kill other people, you know, an outsider might have judged Buddha and said, ah, Buddha is bad, he killed. But we, you know, but we should be very careful to judge, quick to judge yeah. in our current, you know, in our world. Just, we should, you know, if you remember. I'm not sure this is the right forum for having a more 
lengthy discussion because I know Christopher wants to get on with the teaching, but um, I think, you know, it is certainly true that more than one thing can be reality. So in science, we do science, we find out information, and some of that information then is kept uh, and is used in a way that uh, creates, uh, say, I, I don't know, positive benefit. But at the same time, so science is an ever-changing enterprise. We create new knowledge, we modify old knowledge, and so both can be true. You create knowledge that is true as a fact. Antibiotics kill bacteria. That is a fact. At the same time, you know, we now know bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, and therefore antibiotics won't work. Um, and, you know, maybe this is going too much toward nihilism, but if you say that every, every sentient being can have their own reality and that reality can be based upon, um, multiple lifetimes of varied experiences or, or inputs or whatever you want to call them then, you know, I can imagine a scenario where, you know, uh, we end up having people ignoring knowledge that is, I don't know if it's true, accurate, right, factual, I don't know what the right word is to explain it, uh, that then results in damage to themselves and other sentient beings and it's fine to say that we can self-aggregate into like communities of like thought but the problem with that is that we end up not thinking and and we end up aggregating and becoming more resistant to entertaining thought from those that are not part of our community right and some of us do this with a specific negative intent in mind and that they use fear and anxiety to drive the uh, beliefs of individuals uh, and cut off knowledge development. So uh, I, I don't know that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, well, I'm not sure I completely buy into the concept, even though the way you describe it, Christopher, is accurate, that every sentient being lives or has its own reality, which is true. But if, if there's, there has to be some way that, I mean, Buddha said, you know, we got to be nice, kind, compassionate, loving, caring, et cetera. Instead of, he said, you know, kill everybody. I mean, he could have said kill everybody. That would have been a philosophy too. Right. He didn't say that, you know, so, but there are people who have different realities than, than the Buddha does. So, I mean, you Is adopt the reality you like, but, does that, but I'm just saying, how do you know that that's the right reality? No, no. We, we can't say that from the point of view of the particular being who's having that relative reality. It's a relative reality relative to them and their particular experience. And we have the same thing, relative reality to us and our particular experience. And so it's impossible to say that one is right and the other is wrong. But what we're talking about there is relative reality, not ultimate reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to get, we need to put those two together to see what the Buddha is actually saying and why, why the problem of suffering arises. Okay. So if we go further, further, from the examples that we have been talking about, it's clear that relative truths, you know, relative truths for each being or species or whatever you, how you want to put it, they are, they are dependent in nature. They exist only in dependence upon the perspective of an individual being, no matter what they are. However, and here's the kicker here, if an individual's view of relative truth is distorted by the afflicted states of mind, such as anger, hatred, craving desire, and attachment, then the relative truths they perceive will also be distorted. Remember what we're trying to do is to, is to clear up these distortions of um, uh, 
anger and attachment and craving and desire and these things that dis are disturbing our minds and disturbing the way we view everything. This is the this is what the Buddhist point is that this kind of relative truth without without a, without an understanding of what the ultimate truth is is going to go directly to things exist exactly the way they appear and I you know I need them to be this way and if anything gets in the way I'm getting really upset I'm going to get angry I'm going to destroy what's in my way and this this is what's causing all of the suffering so we now. All right, so it's the main reason, it's one of the main reasons why we sentient beings generate so much suffering in our lives. What we do is we grasp onto our particular relative conventional reality as though it were the only reality. And this causes us to make false and distorted assumptions about what we are actually experiencing. This brings us to talk now about ultimate truth. Kentrell Rinpoche says that when we are able to remove all of our misconceptions regarding how reality actually exists, we are left with a mere experience of reality as it is. It is this state of mind that is known as ultimate truth. We can refer, we can use the term ultimate truth to refer to the following four states. First is the omniscient state of an enlightened being's mind that is free from all afflictive and cognitive obscurations. In other words, it's free from all um, the afflictive emotions and the grasping and the attachment. And it's also free of all the ignorance of the way things actually exist. So a, a, we're talking about a Buddhist mind. A Buddhist mind is ultimate truth, you could say. That's the, that's the state of the Buddha's mind, ultimate reality, um, ultimate truth. The second uh, term that we can use to ref that ultimate truth refers to is the ultimate nature of our own experience that is known as emptiness. And of course we have, to, we have to find out what that is and we have to realize what that is, but it's happening. <laughs> According to the Buddha, it's, it's, it's going on right now. Um, the third is the wisdom that directly realizes our empty nature, that empty nature of the mind. And the fourth is our own Buddha nature the innate potential of every sentient being to achieve enlightenment. So we've talked about these all before, but what's now getting put into the context of ultimate truth or the two truths here. When we compare, when we compare this ultimate nature to relative truth, Relative truths appear to be temporary and superficial, like a dream. And the example Kentrell Rinpoche gives, when we're having a vivid dream, the things that appear to us in our dream seem as if they are real and that they're genuinely occurring. But when we wake up from the dream, we understand that everything we believed that was real and true in that dream was actually illusion-like in its appearance. We've all had this experience. You know, you can be in the grips of some kind of dream and you wake up and you go, oh, geez, that was kind of a, that was kind of a vivid dream, but it's, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it bothered me, but it's, oh, but this is, but I'm okay. You know, I'm not, that's not really, you know, really what was, was, what was happening. So it's illusion-like. Similarly, from the perspective of a mind that is, that is abiding in its own nature of ultimate reality through a direct experience of emptiness, all of the relative truths that we hold on to so tightly are also understood to be illusion-like in their appearance. However, saying something is illusion-like is not the same as saying something is an illusion. This is why it's called relative truth, not relative falsity. 
and ultimate truth, not ultimate falsity. So these two truths, as I've often said, they are they arise together, they co-arise. They you cannot have you cannot have one existing without the other. Even the Buddha has a relative truth, a conventional truth. You know, the appearance of the Buddha, the way, the, the only way that we can function and interact uh, is, is through conventional or relative truth. The ultimate truth is basically the, uh, the, uh, the, the quality or the, uh, the mode of existence. The mode of existence. The mode of existence being empty of any kind of uh, inherent nature. It's constantly dependently arising. And it, it matters what we ourselves put in there as the things that are going to, uh, uh, the causes and conditions that are going to cause that dependent arising to occur. We have to understand that these afflictive emotions and this ignorant state of mind does nothing but cause suffering. And we have to, we, the first thing we have to do is remove the afflictive states of, of, of uh, mind through practicing ethics and then through practicing the wisdom teachings, understand what the ignorance is that we've got going on. We can turn the whole thing around, but it's turning, it's like we've often said, it's like turning the Queen Mary that's going, has been going in this direction full steam ahead and then trying to, you know, turn that thing around. It's a big, big process. We have so many uh, we're so habituated to certain ways of thinking and feeling and believing that it to that to change this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to require practice. It's going to require habituation to it. It's going to require repeated study and listening and contemplating and meditating until we begin to it to, begins to clear up. Oh wow! Oh wow! The nature of what I am is transformational, and I can do this if I know how, if I know the methods for it. So. What I would say uh, about your question and concerns, Brian, is that there's no way that this problem that we seem to be having, the, what we will call, what appears to us as a worldwide problem, that there's no way that that's going to be solved at the level of the problem. Samsara or cyclic existence is not going to solve itself. It's not, the, the problem will be solved within cyclic existence. The problem will be solved within the mind that liberates itself from that kind of existence and realizes that it can be completely free of suffering and completely wise and, wis and, and be able to benefit others. So this is for each one of us, it's a, it's a very personal, personal journey. And yet it's all about our interaction with others. It's all about that. It's all about our interdependent connections. So, I hope this is I hope this is helping somewhat. Well, I mean, yeah, and I think all of us are aware that this isn't going to be our doubts and questions are not going to be resolved here in this hour and a half. <laughs> no, no, we're just we're just uh, you know, getting getting there. We're talking about. It. I think well, we'll we won't go too much further because we only have five minutes. But I'm going to say, um, the way Kentrell Rinpoche talks about relative truth. He gives this an ultimate truth. He, he gives this comparison. And he says that relative truth is like the ocean. And the ultimate truth is like the shore. To survive in the ocean, we have to learn how to swim. And once we have the necessary skills to be able to swim, we can then use the ocean which is symbolizing relative truth, to reach the shore of ultimate truth. But we have to remember that without an ocean, there is no shore. And without a shore, there is no ocean. These two truths dependently co-arise. They will always be there. And I think it was, I think it was also, no, who was it? Uh, uh, Kenso Rinpoche, the one who uh, is the, uh, gives the commentary on Nagarjuna's Precious gar Garland, he said, there is no existence but conventional existence. Yeah. There is no ultimate existence. There is only conventional existence. And within that conventional existence is relative truth and ultimate truth. Yesterday, I was listening to a talk on the two truths by a guy named... Um, Jay Garfield. Jay Garfield. I think you'd like him, Brian Herman, and probably anybody who's really science-y oriented, 
he's also an academic, so we, you know. But anyway, he was saying that his teacher would put it this way, that the only way we experience ultimate truth is through conventional reality. That, that, well, right. Conventional existence is the way everything exists. Interestingly, this goes back to the four schools. I found this fascinating. I hope I can express this clearly. Lama Tsongkhapa, who's the founder of the tradition, the lineage that we follow, is holiness the Dalai Lama and all the way down to Geshe Nima and ourselves. So, Gelug. the Gelug, Lama Tsongkhapa says that to understand the true truths, sort of the, the emphasis here is on conventional reality. To understand relative truth will be the gateway. Um, to understanding ultimate truth. Uh, and Jay Garfield said that the Theravadan schools almost believe the opposite, that in a sense, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, when you examine this, what you end up is realizing the importance of relative truth and you treat your interaction with relative truth with a lot more uh, mindfulness, let's just say, you become the steward of the creation of relative truth from now on through your existence. Whereas the Theravadan view is, you know, to understand the two truths, you are, you know, a Theravadan would say, oh, conventional truth is to be abandoned and you want to abide in this uh, abstraction called ultimate truth that somehow as you know, as we've mentioned many times now, it, it lights out. So anyway, I just thought that was sort of interesting. So the goal, according to our lineage, is to celebrate, live, and be great stewards of conventional truth. Yeah, so uh, we should do closing. Yeah. Closing well, prayers. So closing prayers. It's, 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 uh, yeah. Due to this merit of listening and discussing, May we soon attain the enlightened state of Guru Buddha, that we may liberate all sentient beings from suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow, and may that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And may the view of emptiness not yet born arise and grow, and may that born have no decline, but increase more and more. In all my rebirths, may I never be separated from perfect spiritual masters and enjoy the magnificent Dharma, completing all of the qualities of the stages and the paths. May I quickly achieve the state of Vajradhara, primordial Lama, Buddha. Buddha. May anyone who merely sees or hears remembers, touches, or talks to me, be instantly free from all sufferings and abide in happiness forever. It is only from the kindness of my guru that I've met the peerless teachings of the Buddha. Thus, I dedicate all merit so that all sentient beings in the future may be guided by kind and holy gurus. And then skipping down in all my lifetimes, Again, we say this again, never separated from spiritual masters, and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma, fully perfecting the virtues of levels and paths. May I speedily attain the state of Vajradharma. All righty. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Glad to have you. It was, you know, Thanks, Christopher. Thank you, Christopher. It, it's it's COVID. Uh... Jay, the guy's name, if you're interested, is Jay Garfield. Um, and he's, uh, I think he's a professor. He teaches at Harvard Divinity School and at Smith College. Um, he's interesting. He has very, very clear-cut ways of putting this stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he is, I believe, he's he's a big Lama Sokapa guy. So it should of course, be that's his own reality, you know, so... It, yeah, and we're all welcome to it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just always, always remember to use your discernment, you know, and sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Take care. Right. See you next week. All right. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um,